uh, just to start this off, um, my handle's Mr. Brimley, not my name. Uh, I'm not related to Wilford at all. Uh, I've been in information security for five years, uh, IT for about 19, before that I was in college, and before that I spent a lot of time farming. So we're going to talk about parallels between information security and biological security. And as soon as I can get the slides to come up, we're going to look first off at what is biosecurity. And the U.S. Department of Agriculture has a very nice definition, which basically boils down to... I think we need to reboot all the things. Anyhow, biological security is basically defined as trying to prevent any harmful materials, whether they are biological, chemical, what have you, from entering the the food chain uh, that, w that we have. Um, mind you, it's, it, it is a Department of Agriculture de definition. They're going to mo mostly focus on food safety. Uh, there's a... But when you're dealing with people, it's more under the rubric of public health. And you'll hear public health brought up a lot if you stand in biosecurity, with the, depending on what you're working on. And we're almost there. Uh, it is duplicated. But... The key bit here that we're, we're looking at is we have a, a, a situation in both information security and biological security where there's a lot of language that's common between the two of them. So, for example, uh, we have viruses in both. We have worms in both. We have, we, we talk about infections. Uh, to go out more to the ecology standpoint, occasionally you'll hear about watering hole attacks, which brings up the image of some poor gazelle on the Serengeti going up to get a drink and being snatched by a crocodile, uh, where in fact it's somebody waiting in ambush uh, at a website that is popular and injecting malware there. And these, and, and these are very well thought out allegories between the two. We're going to blow through the first three slides real quick. As soon as LibreOffice comes up. Uh, but it's very well considered because, for example, a computer virus is absolutely dependent on having another piece of software available to it to propagate into a new system. And if you know anything about real viruses, they are obligatory parasites that absolutely have to have a cell in order to reproduce. Uh, the worm analog is, you know, a piece of malware that can propagate on its own, much like a worm. An actual worm can propagate on its own. So we're actually dealing with the same paradigm in both places. In both information security and biological security, what we really have is we have a pervasive threat environment. Everything that's out in the great big wide world can possibly cause you harm. You know, there's a million bacteria out there. Some of them, mind you, are at least beneficial. You have more bacterial cells in your, in, in your stomach than you have actual human cells in your body, uh, stomach and intestines. But even an imbalance in that can cause illness. In information security on the internet, you have a pervasive threat environment. Every system out there can possibly harm your network. Uh, you have rapidly changing, evolving threats. You make a countermeasure, and the next thing, that threat, the, the, the threats that are out there will evolve to the next level in order to evade your countermeasure. You have uh, an immune system response, and it'll kill 99.99% of the bacteria, but the ones that survive can deal with that immune response or that antibiotic. So in reality, if you're looking at it and you're new, you're, you're experienced in information security and you're looking at wanting to go in because you want to breed your own yeast for your custom uh, brewing, yeah, I like beer, uh, you shouldn't be intimidated because it's the same sort of mindset in keeping, in keeping sterile procedure in your biohacking that you would have in your information security. You know, you've got the same type of best practices, and they really boil down to four concepts. Your know, first concept is isolation. You want to have a work environment that you've got 
full control over so that you can basically get yourself prepared to do actual work. Uh, and you know, we do this in information security, we firewall off our networks, uh, we put in application proxies, we try and do everything we can to keep the bulk of the internet out of our networks. You know, you're not going to sit there and, and run your production facility uh, so that anybody can walk along and throw something into your, in, in, into your, uh, your, your stuff. Uh, the second one is sanitation. You know, once you've got your isolated environment, you need to clean it up so that it is fit to work in so that you don't have any unwanted effects. Wow, Libor Office is taking a long time. So in the information security milieu, that would be patching, vulnerabilities management, uh, antivirus, you know, keeping your antivirus up to date, uh, making sure your ACL, your, your access control lists are up to date, making sure that your uh, logins are, are up to date and you've hired out people who are no longer working there. In the biosecurity environment, that's basically you know standard sterile procedure. You're going to go wipe down everything with a bleach solution. Uh, you're going to make sure that everything's kept clean. Uh, you're going to run through. You're going to you're going to run your glassware, for example, through a sterile. Possibly throw it through an autoclave, depending on what you're. Third concept: monitoring. Now that you've got it isolated and sterilized, you need to keep an eye on things to make sure that nothing. Untold, you know, unwanted comes in. You've gone to all this trouble to make a good environment. You need to keep an eye on it. You know, in information security, that would be monitoring your IDSs, monitoring uh, your your IPSs, your your host IPSs. In biosecurity, you're going through with a checklist saying, how, when did this last get sterilized? When did this last get wiped down? When was the last spill? Have we gone through to at, at the end of the shift and recleaned everything? And then the last thing is education, and this is probably the most important part, because with education, you, your, your employees, if you actually have a business, they're wonderful. They will try and make things as efficient as possible, and a lot of the times, they will do this in ways that will bite you hard. So education, in large part, is teaching people what corners they absolutely cannot cut. You know, it's either, no, we, we are not allowing USB, we are not, we're, we're, we're disabling it at the machine level, and don't even bother bringing it in. If you find a CD out in the parking lot, yeah, don't, don't insert it into one of the local machines here. We, we would really appreciate you not doing that. That would be bad. Uh, for biosecurity, all right, you've come off a break. Uh, even if you're talking at a fast food restaurant, they say, wash your hands every time you go off from your station. You've got to teach these folks to wash their hands every time they go, they go back, go out and come back, or else they won't because they'll try and save a couple minutes. And I've got, I really would. Uh, uh, well, that would explain it. Out where I'm from, I'm from Columbus, Ohio. We have an ice cream company called Jenny's Ice Cream. They sell $10 a pint ice cream. I'm a monstrous cheapskate, it's worth it. Ah, there we go. Thank you. Uh. And now, the really fast presentation of the slide. Yeah, precautions. And here's our terminology. And here's our thread analog. Isolation and sanitation. Education and monitoring. And my example, Jenny's Ice Cream. Well, great place, but in May 25th, May this year, they did, you know, they export ice cream all around the Midwest. Wisconsin, the folks in Wisconsin found Listeria in Jenny's ice cream, and this is not where you want to have a notification coming from. You want to find it in your facility right off the bat so you can go, okay, yeah, we caught it, we're going to do our own recall, but there's no brand damage. 
or not serious brand damage. Yeah, we're on it. We're already on it. Bluebell did this. Uh, Listeria, for those of you who aren't in the dairy business, it's endemic in soil. It causes a form of food poisoning that is potentially lethal, and freezing does not kill it, which means dairy farmers are paranoid about Listeria. Well, the FDA came in, did an inspection, and found out that there were no testing programs in place, no sanit you know, very poor sanitation, grime in places that there shouldn't be grime, uh, no cross-contamination procedures. Uh, in fact, the new facility that they had just built has a garden outside, and employees are encouraged to go work in the garden on their breaks to you know, kind of clear their minds, and there was no procedure that said, all right, now that you've come back in, wash your hands, change your coveralls, get all, you know, all new work outfit before you go back on the floor. Now, this is similar to having an IT environment where you're not doing vulnerability scans, you don't have antivirus, you don't really have a firewall. Uh, the last time somebody checked to see whether people, whether the, the employee list matched up with the, the accounts list was two years ago. It's inevitable something bad is going to happen. And Jenny's is selling quality and craftsmanship. The only analog I can come up to in the IP, in the uh, IT space right now is the OPM hack. It's that level of incompetence. So the company had to recall all their products, two and a half million dollars of product, immediately shit canned, out the door, refunds to the grocery stores, whole nine yards, and had to suspend operations. Uh, they you know, For a month, they came back on online uh, by borrowing the equipment of another dairy in Ohio, uh, which means, first off, they're paying rent for all that. And it's a wonderful uh, opportunity for industrial espionage because this is another custom dairy. Uh, and it turns out that this outbreak is tracked down to a single pint filling machine that had, a listeria, that had listeria contamination on it. So this is going to bring us up to the big difference between, in for a second, biosec. Biosecurity has a lot thinner margins for error. Part of that's because we've been doing agricultural safety for 100 years now or more, uh, whereas we've been doing information security seriously for about 20 years. You know, before that, you had all these little isolated not, not clusters of computing power. Uh, so the key difference is, is in order to mess with something in the biosecurity for milieu, you have to be there physically. You know, you can't just attack from across the country unless somebody really has some mistake in their information set up, IT set up that lets you hack some SCADA thing there. InfoSec lets, allows for remote access, and we all know this. Uh, biosecurity has a lot more aggressive countermeasures. Uh, product recalls go in instantly. Uh, they're applied very quickly by the companies themselves to avoid financial liabilities. Um, and if you're a if you're a, a cattle farmer, like I used to be, uh, if you have one cow with hoof and mouth disease, guess what? You just lost the whole herd. It's the same thing as saying, uh, we had a Windows XP1 box that got hacked. Now we have to sit there and trash the entire network and rebuild it from scratch. Uh, very, very serious. And it's because the consequences are a lot more serious. With, uh, with InfoSec failures, you've got financial problems, you've got reputation problems. Unless you're dealing with medical hack, uh, med hacking a medical device, odds are somebody's not going to die. With biosecurity, lives are on the line. And the legal penalties reflect this too. Uh, in biosecurity, at the, at the start, if you have a problem, you're dealing with lawsuits for negligence. And these can lead to large financial penalties, which is why everyone recalls at the drop of a hat. You know, the, le the less exposure that somebody could possibly get injured, the less money you'll pay out. And if you have deliberate violations, you know, you phonied up the documentation that you gave to the local Department of Health, congratulations, there's fraud charges coming. Uh, if you are really, truly incompetent in how you're managing your, uh, your, your operations, uh, no, we're not, we, we have no control. Somebody could walk up and dump in potassium cyanide at any point in time, we have no idea. Um, I can see a good sharp prosecutor starting to go on the involuntary manslaughter to up to depraved indifference. Uh, it's a lot nastier. I remember Tylenol lost a boatload of money and a boatload of reputation because 
they didn't package things so that somebody who wanted to mess with their product after it was out of their control could do so. So let's summarize this. Biosecurity and information security have actually very similar environments. It's a pervasive in a threat environment with adaptive threats. Uh, the result is you actually have similar mindsets and countermeasures. You want isolation, you want sanitation, you want education, and you want monitoring. Uh, but the costs for failure are a lot higher in biosecurity because the legalities are a lot more mature and the stakes are a lot higher. And you get a lot of dead loss immediately. That little EULA that you have for information in every software license that says, we take no responsibility whatsoever at all if your data gets trashed by our product, that doesn't fly in anything biologically, in anything biological. So I hope that if any of you are looking to go are in information technology and you're looking to go into biological work, I hope this helps. Uh, if you're in biological work and you're looking at information technology and information security, guess what? You've already got the mindset, you're halfway there. And, you know, if neither, well, I hope it was at least entertaining. So thank you all very much, and a special thanks to the guy who's following me for yielding some time. Thank you. And uh, we have some websites in here in the slides for if you want to get more information. Okay, so uh, next up we have Michael Goetzman talking about the um, implications of DNA storage and acquisition. It's a pretty rad talk. Um, while he's getting set up, do you want to do some Q&A, kind of impromptu Q&A? Otherwise, after this session, the way we're running it is if you have questions and you want to talk to the speakers, you can go to the uh, biohacking village tables out in the contest area and the speakers will be out there. Yeah, I'll, I'm more than happy to take questions. Uh, let me get... I brought my assistant. <laughs> so, uh, any questions from anybody? Well, either I was extremely informative or you were not interested. Um, I'm going to flatter myself and say that it was the first, but you've all been a great audience. Uh, nobody heckled, nobody threw anything, nobody said you suck. Uh, I'm going to take that as a win.